Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar, where the topic will be the state of ed tech, what's working, what's coming, and what's needed. My name is Chris Kay. I'm an account executive with GoGuardian. And we are live in Surprise, Arizona, about an hour outside of Phoenix. And we are live on site at Dysart Unified School District. Today, I'm accompanied by an awesome group of panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to go around, have everyone introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about the organization that you represent, and what your role is. Awesome. I'm the head of innovation at GoGuardian, so I get to put things back together again after we break them, um, and hopefully they work a lot better. Uh, my name is Scott Hasse. Uh, I am the network manager at Gilbert Public Schools. Uh, I've been there for about 10 years. Hi, I'm John Costelhano. I'm the executive director of technology for Gilbert Public Schools. Um, I'm just actually finishing up my first year there, um, but I've been in K-12 for about 20 years now. Wow. Diana Hawari, I'm the CIO for Dysart Unified School District. Um, I oversee the IT department. I've been at the district for about seven years, but in K-12 about 20. My name is Matthew Corrington. Uh, I am also with uh, Dysart Unified School District, and I am the systems architect, and I oversee the uh, network and infrastructure side of things. All right, and we have Eileen on remote as well. Eileen, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, I am Eileen Huang. I am a program manager on the Google for Education team. So I work with school districts across Arizona, aligning with district leaderships and a lot of strategic planning on thinking about how do we support our teachers as they are bringing technology into classrooms? Um, what does a pilot look like? What is Google for Education? So any type of those questions, I am the go-to. Thanks, everyone. So as a quick reminder, we will be covering a wide variety of topics today and truly hope that you take home some information that you find valuable. Uh, but please do remember that you can also chat in questions to us and we will have some time uh, afterwards to go over your guys' questions. So to kick things off, um, just wanted to have our panelists please describe um, kind of what technology looks like currently in your district and a little bit of your technology journey to what it's taken to get up to this point today. Well. Um it's an ever-evolving area, but um, you know, currently we're at a five gig internet pipe with a five gig WAN. Um, each of our site lake locations have um, secondary locations have one gig um, WAN connections, and our elementaries are at 500 meg. Um, seems to be a, a good throughput right now on our sites, um, but that has evolved from 500 meg three years ago all the way to five gig you know, in three years. So it's, it's, it's rapidly evolving, <laughs> especially as uh, the one-to-one -one programs um, have kicked in. And so Gilbert Public Schools uh, has about 36,000 students. And so um, like Scott said, about three years ago, there was a comprehensive uh, uh, strategic operating plan put in place uh, uh, with all the stakeholders. Um, to actually prepare all of our classrooms for mobility and to um, be able to handle a one-to-one -one environment. So uh, the infrastructure absolutely was upgraded and then uh, the plan was set in place to uh, have a one-to-one -one take home program, uh, seventh through 12th grade. So we just finished the second year of that implementation. Next year we'll, be, uh, we'll complete uh, with 11th and 12th grade grades. Um, so that's been one main area of focus right now. Uh, in the district along with the digital curriculum platform uh, implementation as well, which has been started. Did I start, uh, we started our journey early, probably about 2009, we became a BYOD uh, district. Uh, once we did that, we uh, realized that we needed to build up our infrastructure. Uh, we had some issues with wireless, uh, not knowing that students were going to bring more than one device. <laughs> and uh, um, it forced us to look back and focus on getting our infrastructure uh, built. And so now we have a pretty strong infrastructure in that. We'll probably talk more about that. Um, that uh, it's based on need. So the more devices we get, the closer we get to one-to-one -to -one personalized learning, uh, we make sure the infrastructure is in place prior to uh, implementing those devices. And yeah, we've, we've moved uh, <clears throat> ourselves up to a six gig uh, internet connection. Um, you know, over the last few years to really support uh, a lot of this one-to-one -one initiative with the BYOD initiative and online testing um, mm -hmm. to allow us to really get all the students on at one time um, and utilize that bandwidth. Uh, we also have from our high schools a, a gig back here uh, and then the K-8s do 600 megs uh, using uh, Metro E. 
Very nice. So you guys both, both districts here touched on going one-to-one. -one. So I'm curious, it seems like everyone across the country these days is talking about going one-to-one. -one. Um, and so I'm curious to hear you guys' thoughts on what it takes to go one-to-one -one, and do you think that it's working? Do you think we can measure the impact that one-to-one -one is having in education and is it making a positive impact? Well, I think it takes lots of planning. Um, you know, just throw it out there and see if it works. Um, so you definitely want to structure it and plan it out, um, pilot a site, um, get, gain the knowledge that you need to move um, and expand it. Um, I, think it, I think it works. I think it's working. Um, from what I can see from the teachers and the students, it's, it's kind of given them a re-energized approach to teaching and learning. Um, I think it's been good. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times you hear that change takes three years, but honestly, in a one-to-one -one program, I think you're really looking at more four to five years. Um, I mean, you're changing the entire culture uh, of those grade levels that are participating in that. So one of the areas that uh, in Gilbert that, uh, you know, we try to focus on, I mean, the, the infrastructure piece is not an easy piece, although truly that's the easiest mm -hmm. part of the whole thing. Um, but uh, we have a, a, a group of uh, 14 uh, technology integration educators, and they're key in uh, helping those classroom teachers uh, really know what to do with that technology. Um, the teachers are the experts at teaching, um, and this group is experts experts on technology as well as former teachers, and so they work closely together. But um, you know, the buy-in from everyone though is truly the most important piece of the one-to-one. -one. If you don't have that, then it won't work. Uh, period, in my opinion. Um, and so that's that's critical um, of all stakeholders. And the principals have to, it's their campus. So at the end of the day, they're really the ones who own that program. And they're super important to, to that success. I agree. Um, I know that one-to-one -one is the big, the big phrase out there right now. Uh, but we like to look at it more like personalized learning. So with our focus on personalized learning, one-to-one -one is just one aspect of that. So along with the technology is the content, is the teachers and the PD and all of that. It's all um, kind of a, a set uh, together. So if one of those things fails in that personalized learning, and it's, gonna, it's not going to work properly. So for us, yes, one-to-one -one is, is an initiative, but because of uh, how it supports personalized learning, which is our true goal. And it is important to have that infrastructure in place, uh, as they mentioned before. Um, and piloting that because that's where you learn, you know, what not to do yeah. and be able to kind of move forward in the right direction when you go global. So oh, yeah. And it hasn't, I mean, it hasn't been smooth. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and we learn from our mistakes and go back and, and fix it so that when we roll it out on a bigger scale that we don't have as many issues. So, yeah, definitely piloting is, is huge. Awesome. I had some follow-up questions mm -hmm. based on the kind of the answers you guys had. First off, you guys both mentioned you had pretty large backgrounds in ed tech prior to your current roles. Mm -hmm. What were those? I worked for a Glendale Elementary School District. Uh, I was there, um, I don't even remember what my title was. It was, a, <laughs> I think it was systems administrator, so it was right under the director of IT for about eight to nine years. Wow. And then I worked at Dysart uh, before that uh, as a computer technician uh, wow. way back in the, the 90s. <laughs> and, um, and I was also on the Dysart governing board for six years. So. Going back to the 90s again. <laughs> um, yeah, I, was, I started off as a classroom teacher. So I taught in the elementary school for four years uh, and then moved into the ed tech side as a trainer and then you know, to, the, to the director level. So um, yeah, I think that background is super important. I think more and more that you see the CIOs and the tech directors and the, um, they have that background because you can't lose sight of what's happening in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's, you can't, you know, the department of no, 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 that's of the past, I'll say that mm -hmm. you know, yeah, and so that's. What, what is that? What's the department of no, no, no? <laughs> well, <laughs> as you, anytime there's a request for something related to technology, no, yes. we can't do that. No. IT was the place they always say no because yeah, of right. security, because the mm. equipment's so expensive. Maybe no, you can't do that. No, we can't let that through the filter. No, we, and those days are over. Now it's what can we do to make it happen? We have to put um, those policies in place to make sure that we can give them what they need, but still stay secure. Right. And was that synonymous with the the kind of the, the journey of ed tech entering? Is that when the no 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 culture kind of stopped, or when did that 
kind of drop off? Yes, as the that? need, as the need, I think for uh, being able to get online and being and having those devices, um, we we had to stop saying no because that's where we were going. It was going that way, so it was more of yes. Let's just figure out how we can make it work for you. So, and we had to, we did have to go through an evolution of that techie person to that education person. So, working very closely with Ed Services, knowing what's going on in the classrooms. Um, our currently our tech specialists are they're no longer computer technicians they're technology specialists because they also get training in the classroom side of things so that they can help with innovation of technology into the classroom and support those teachers that's awesome wow very cool and uh your guys program is 7 to 12 and i know you guys is that correct or it will be 7 will 10, be yeah, cool. plan. Yeah. what is the plan are you guys have any plan moving down towards six fifth or what does that look like and how are you going to test those waters out yeah so right now there actually is um uh, a group that's working with the sixth grade uh, classrooms and so we've tried to concentrate devices at the sixth grade now to obviously prepare them mm -hmm. um, for that junior high that next step um, you know it's going to take time uh, but that separation needs to not be there though anymore you can't wait till sixth grade and okay let's put technology in their hands so and that's a work in progress the elementary level. Wow. And do you guys have any similar kind of experience with that? For us, it's based on programs or academies, special programs and academies. So um, if the program uh, or academy requires more technology, um, requires more online content, then that's where our focus goes, regardless of the grade level. Uh, right now, most of our academies out are, just happen to be uh, probably seven, sixth and seventh and up. but. Um, but we don't have like certain grade levels that we roll out to or certain sites. It's based off of need and um, and what their plans are for the technology. That's awesome. And Scott, you mentioned that you've seen teachers kind of get re-energized or re-innovated with the introduction of tech into the classroom. Do you have any kind of overarching things that you've seen that really has got them excited? Well, my wife's a teacher, so I get a first-hand view okay. of, uh, <laughs> of what's happening. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's a matter of moving thing. Communication, I think, is a big part of it because before you have a, give a student a, an assignment, they hand in that assignment, and there's no collaboration on it. Now, with, you know, Google and, and, and the different tools, you can collaborate on it. It's not a eight to three school day. It's a 24-hour school day. You know, so there's always communication between the students and the teachers. Um, you know, homework assignments are handed in when they're done, you know. They don't necessarily have to wait till the next day or a week later. Um, so I think you see a lot of that. Um, there's new, you know, methodology approaches to how teachers are teaching. Um, it's been really exciting to see. That's awesome. And Diana, and last follow-up question, I promise, on the first <laughs> series of questions. Um, you said you have PD around building personalized learning kind of experiences. Mm -hmm. What does that look like, or how did you even start? Because that's kind of a really innovative take on Before, how to We have um, 21st century specialists, and we have, I think we have 14 of them in the district. And mm -hmm. so they are not assigned to any school. They're not assigned to, to any certain program. They're basically there to support the teachers with any innovative ideas that they have and to help them uh, come up with those innovative ideas of what, you know, how to use technology or different ways of teaching, uh, personalized learning, those types of things. So um, whenever we roll out new technology or um, like if we're talking about 3D printers or virtual reality, uh, none, none of those devices go out without that training first so that uh, we don't walk around in those sites and see them collecting dust and nobody's <laughs> using them sitting in a corner. So this way we make sure that they're being used and being used properly. And, uh, and I think once that uh, the teachers or staff members get the training, they have the confidence then to actually use it and it won't be sitting there collecting dust. Do you, any, do you see any kind of like a, a wave effect of when you get a certain group of teachers that it kind of propagates through the district, the kind of the people who feel confident in it? Oh yeah, well we have our 21st century specialists get very excited about about everything, but about um, <laughs> innovation. They're very excited about innovation. So when they get out there and you see the excitement, it, you can't help but you know go along with it and get excited about what's coming. And so um, it's it's been very successful. Oh, awesome. You're always going to have your early adopters, right? And you want those you know people out there because they do get everyone excited mm -hmm. around them. And most of the time, they're the leaders, anyways. You know, yeah. so when you see someone else doing something innovative or just different in the classroom. You know, it's kind of, 
one know. of those things, <laughs> and and that's what helps propagate things in any environment, but you know, especially in the school as well, I believe. And so you guys kind of have built programs around those kind of people to kind of really spread that that yeah. wealth of excitement and knowledge. Right. I mean, you know, our district is large, right? So there's people trying things every day. I mean, and that's what you want, you know, and our principals are supportive of that as well. So you don't want to hold somebody back. Um, and so that, that that's important. But if we can then also come behind them and step in and support that even more so to help them take that to the next level or just see what their where their creativity takes them with their students in the classroom, that's a win-win. Mm -hmm. That's beneficial for everybody. Definitely. It's to find those people and put them out there in the forefront so other people can see them. You know, having um, technology showcases or, or things like that where other staff members can see what they're doing. So something that might, you might think is complicated actually will make your life easier if you start doing it. So uh, it's very important. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. So <laughs> we've talked a lot about, you know, going one-to-one. -one. I'm curious what some of the benefits and challenges you guys have seen um, with going one-to-one -one is versus uh, more of the CART model. Did you guys kind of jump straight to going one-to-one -one with certain um, campuses or grade levels, or did you kind of start with CARTs, graduate from CARTs to one-to-one? -to -one? And do you have any advice for uh, districts out there who are considering going one-to-one? -one? Um, ours started out as a pilot at an elementary with a couple CARTs. Um, it quickly grew into you know, a one-to-one -one development. And uh, so the pilot was okay, but it didn't give you a real-world test, especially when you're talking about take-home one-to-one. Um, so we, we ran into some challenges um, the first year of seven and eight grade, uh, eighth grade. Um, you know, we ran into a problem with filtering at home, you know. Um, we were trying an old older methodology of proxying it back into our core and, and filtering it that way and it would fail every so often and either one of two results, leave the student wide open or lock them out completely. So it was not ideal. Um, you know, so I, we've had some growing pains that way. Um, you know, luckily Go Guardian saved us. <laughs> um, it, it, it worked out good. Um, the other thing is, you know, trying to find the right tools and apps to go along with Chromebooks in this instance, you know, um, you know, Google's great, but it's limited in its, its tool set as far as um, integration with Active Directory and, and other tools. Um, so finding those right pieces to make a seamless transition into that world um, is difficult, but it's it's easily doable. Logistics of a one-to-one -one program. I mean, I don't think they're different anywhere you go. You're dealing with the same, some of the same issues with repair and breakage and just normal day-to-day -day use. When you have thousands of students walking around with devices, you're going to have things happen. Huh? But that those pieces can all be worked out. I, in my previous district, I lived through a, a program where we did um, start in the seventh and eighth grade. Um, and for two years it was take home. Um, and then we, we did pull that back for the seventh to eighth graders, but the 912 continued to take their devices home. And initially it was more work for the classroom teachers because we did put carts in those rooms. However, now you're dealing with six, seven times a day. You know, do you assign those devices to a student? Do they come in? Did that last person, you know, it's the old typewriter lab issue who popped the key off the, you know and the teacher has to go back so really that creates more time for the teacher to manage that than actually have the students build ownership uh, with that device huh? but with that being said we'll continue to have those discussions in our district about is what's the right way to do it and those are good healthy discussions to have but having the student own the device Personally, I think that's uh, more beneficial to that student. It creates ownership, responsibility, and they can quickly pull out their device when it's needed. You know, they're not sitting there through the entire class staring at a computer. That's not how technology really should look in a classroom. You know, it's there when they need it for whatever activity that they're doing in the classroom. So, just like a textbook. Yeah, yeah like a textbook. <laughs> not a lot of difference. Yeah, not a lot of difference. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. and it's that that ownership also that uh, you know might prevent the student from popping off the keys or exactly. do that because they know. That's mine for the whole year. Mm -hmm. I need to 
make it work for me for the whole year, you know, so they're not going to start vandalizing the equipment as easily, I think. Right. And for us, we're in the really early stages of one-to-one. -one. We're just finishing up our first pilot with um, our Innovation Academy, and um, we had uh, the middle school age students able to take their one-to-one -one devices home, and the amount that we received that were lost or stolen or broken was extremely limited compared to the carts that we have in the classrooms where you don't know who did it. Yes. And and you don't find out about it until the summer when we're doing our inventory <laughs> and see the damage that was done. But um, we've already had at the Innovation Academy, we had what we call a buddy check where you give your Chromebook to the neighbor and they go through a checklist to make sure. And yeah. it was pretty successful and it was not, um, it's not as horrifying as we thought it was going to be, you know. <laughs> Knowing what goes on in the carts, we just thought, oh my gosh, this is going to cost so much money. The, the damage was, was very small, small percentage compared. So I think that's true. I think taking ownership of it and having that responsibility, knowing that that's yours and that next year you're going to get that same combo when you come in, um, makes a difference on how they're treated. I mean, yeah, there are, there are accidents, and accidents are accidents, and they're fixable. Um, so the logistics and, and kind of the tech behind launching a one-to-one -one program is hard, as it is, I'm sure. But what about the uh, the non-tech and logistics part? The community, the parents, the teachers, getting the students on board. What are the kind of challenges you guys face there? Well, part of our part of our one-to-one -one is like I talked about before the personalized learning. So that's the big. Um, I think for instructors, uh, it's a different way of teaching. It's a different way in our innovation academy. Um, we don't, there's no desks. I mean, there's desks, but it's not set up in rows. There's couches, there's bean bags. Students can go anywhere in the classroom uh, to do their work. They can work on math, English, whatever they want, as long as they reach that goal uh, by the end of the week or the month or the year. Um, so that is a hard way, a hard for the parents and community to wrap their head, head around since that's not how they were taught. So it's getting them to come in and see how it's working and see how successful it is. And they do invite, uh, we've had, we have had lots of publicity on it, lots of PR so that people could see how it's working. And then people go, oh, okay, I, I see that. As for outside of Innovation Academy, I think that if there is not, if the content isn't there, and my child is bringing home a device that they're never using except to goof off on because there is no work for them to do, then there's no point in them having that device. Now it's just something for, for them to mess around on when I would rather see them actually doing things on it. So it's that whole package. It's the device. It's the content. It's the teacher. It's mm -hmm. The whole thing has to be working. Yeah, I mean, truly, it, it is. It's uh, All the stakeholders that need to come to the table for that discussion is... I mean, that's the most difficult piece, right? It's, it's that communication and that planning part of it. Um, but I, I agree, once you do get past that initial piece, you have to continue to show people what you are doing, right? Because if they don't know, it's something new, especially to your you know, parents or community members that you know, a lot of times are supporting these with bonds or overrides. Um, they need to see where that investment went and how it's benefiting the, the students. So um, it, it's a huge piece. It's been, you know, it's been done many, many different creative ways to do that. I also think in the very beginning of planning, it does not hurt to A, visit as many places that are already doing something uh, like that to gain their knowledge. Uh, Find see, out what mistakes they had. See what they went through, <laughs> you know, learn from their pain right. points, you know, because someone's going to come and learn from yours mm -hmm. as well. And it also doesn't hurt to bring in uh, experts in the area to help you plan. They're going to hit on some questions and things that you may not have even thought of that's going to lead to other conversations uh, so that everyone can be on board with it. Wow, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Sending home during summer, what do you guys think of that? <laughs> you want to speak from your side and then I'll jump in after that? Right, because it was take yes on the take home you know, gives them a bunch of responsibility and it obviously it lets them do their homework. It's it's a great tool for at home. What about during summer? Well, obviously it's a little more trickier. Um, with them taking it home in the summer, multiple factors play a role. You know, the, the drop breakage of it in that time period. Um, but you also have to keep monitoring and filtering and and doing those things and keeping certain aspects of your Google environment up um, to facilitate them over the summer for what reason? What's, you know, what's, what's the goal there for a personal 
Netflix box. <laughs> um, so, you know, personally, it, it, it's kind of a touchy subject. Um, I don't see much need for it, um, but obviously my thoughts can change rather quickly if something came along. Yeah, I mean, I'll, so I'll throw a little different take, which is great because we always <laughs> bounce <laughs> stuff off each other, so it's wonderful. Um, well, so one thing we have done for the first time for summer school this year is that the students normally had to turn in their Chromebooks, right? And so then they would go to summer school and then, you know, they'd, where's my device at, right? Because we can't supply all those those students. So, so now the students will actually at least keep them if they're taking summer school, they will keep them through the end of summer school and then turn them in. I think looking at that from a little bit different lens is, you know, sometimes you hear with the one-on-one -on -one program, well, my, my kiddo, my student already has a device at home, right? So why do they need that, right? And that's a whole other conversation. But one thing that we've done with our sixth graders in that program is that there is a so summer program that the students have to qualify for. But if they, if they qualify for that, they have to go through the, the courses with two teachers on each of the uh, elementary campuses. It's just at the elementary school right now. Um, and we provide them a hotspot and a Chromebook for the summer because those students don't have a device at home, right? And so that you get into a little bit of that equitable or, or access or, or internet. Or internet. Wow. And so we're starting small with that. And you know, I would love to see that grow into meeting that need across the, the district um, and just be a program because you know, there's a lot of learning that can take place in the summertime. A lot of students do have devices, so that's, but, the, but the students that don't, what an easy and great way to provide that for them. That is them. phenomenal. Yeah, so. That is really cool. All right, so what are you guys most excited about um, cutting edge technologies that you see coming to the classrooms, um, whether it's in the next year or two or in the next five years? Is there stuff that kind of stands out or that you guys are eagerly awaiting to um, come to education? Well, I think, you know, it, it, it's rapidly changing every day, you know, and, and it's hard to envision what uh, a few years out looks like. Um, but with, you know, kind of like they were talking about with the, the academy, you know, the interactive TVs and, and, and these different devices, when the, when the price part points start coming down on those and, and it's more accessible to more classrooms, I think you're going to see more of that in, infused into the classroom. Um, it, it's neat to see, uh, e even now, I mean, even just with the Chromebook edition, um, you, you can see the the, the positives of, of technology. And I think as you add more, whether it be VR, smart board type things, um, more interactive devices, um, teleconferencing, you know, being able to do a class project with a school in Utah or Florida or China, uh, wherever, um, I, I think you, you'll start seeing more of that and, and more collaboration and communication across the country. Yeah, there's so many things to be excited about, I guess. I mean, it is because things are rapidly changing every day and the possibilities are endless. But space is something that I'm very excited about, um, and that's furniture, right? It seems so simple, <laughs> right. but furniture is expensive also. Um, but just watching the classroom space start to change, and I think that'll evolve over time to where, you know, we're, you don't buy a desk anymore, that thought is just completely gone. It's building that creative space. It still allows, you know, the instructor, the teacher to do their mini lessons here and there if they need to, but then it's more of a collaborative space and we're writing on the walls just as well as we have devices to, to grab. So to me, that's exciting. I think that's really the next step that uh, in our schools that we need to get there a little bit sooner. I mean, all of our businesses are already there and those spaces are set up so that there can be that collaboration and you work on a project, you don't work on it by yourself, mm -hmm, right. right? So I think that's, that's super, uh, super exciting for me. And then of course, you know, the convertible laptop into the tablets now just seems so s smart, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, with, you know, with, with Android coming on as, a, as the OS with the, with the Chromebooks and whatnot, I think that's going to open it up a little bit because my kids still want to type when they're typing a paper on a traditional keyboard, but the rest of the time they want to be in tablet mode um, doing whatever they're doing. So that, that's exciting as well. I would, uh, yeah, like metaphorically, and I want to say metaphorically, breaking down the walls of the classroom, I don't think you said. Yeah. Uh, the, um, where the, it's not just while you're in those four walls, and it's just not from 7 to 3.30, it's, it's 24-7. 
uh, anytime, anywhere access. Um, I'm excited about seeing uh, hardware evolve as much as I am about online content evolving and what's going to be available to the teachers and the students online. Uh, that's what pushes us. So the more online, the more we build our infrastructure, the more devices we get. Um, so yeah, for, for IT, believe me, virtual reality, 3D printing, we geek out over that. We think it's great. <laughs> but, um, but they still need, uh, the students in the classroom still need those tools that, uh, to get to that content, and that content has to be there in order for them to get the right education. And um, and I, I am excited about like the breaking down those walls and not having that furniture and being able to have each student learn the way that is best for them. And I think it's exciting just to think about what's going to be out there, you know, in five years. I mean, things that we're we're even gonna we can't even think about now that it, how different. It can be. Like, why didn't we think of it? Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Why didn't we think to flip it back? It's so simple. But. So you guys have all touched a little bit on kind of like the layout of the classroom is changing. Can you describe a little bit about like how that's looking now in your classrooms and who's really driving that? Like who from your district is the person who is going out there and helping to kind of redesign the classroom? I think the students are driving right. it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's coming from the, the students because this is how they learn. I mean, it's hard, you'll be hard pressed to find a student that does not have some type of device that is glued to their ear or their hand or it, that's the way they learn. So if, if we were not evolving and you put a big clunky desktop in front of them, they're going to shut down and that's it. So we're kind of, uh, we're forced to evolve along with, with the students. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had mentioned right before this meeting about going to the students and asking them what devices they would like to use. I mean, that's that's the key right there is, is finding out which is the best way that they're going to learn. And it could be different Great. for each student you ask. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, my son, who's in uh, second grade, uh, he asked us to buy him a yoga ball because he said, <laughs> if I bring in a yoga ball, I can use that as my chair. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, that type of thing, you know, where they're kind of driving it, you know, of what's going to work best for them, make them comfortable for their learning environment. So. Yeah, I mean, everything that they said, absolutely. Um, you know, we have to build a, a, a mindset or a culture that's willing to accept that those changes as adults. And if we don't, then nothing probably will change. And you don't want to have to go in and enforce a different arrangement in the classroom upon somebody, right? Forcing something never, never works. Um, but with those early adopters and the students and polling the students and surveying those kids and, you know, listening to them, I think it would quickly evolve into changing some of the spaces and just thinking more, you know, how we deliver uh, the content in the classroom. I mean, it's still the most important thing, in my opinion, in the classroom is the teacher. But with everything else around, you know, we can even build a, an environment that, that meets our students where they need to be met. So how's the, how has the role of the teacher changed now with these devices in the classroom? Well, I've never been a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, you know, it, it's the cliche thing to say, you know, their teachers are more the facilitators now, right, and more of guiding the learning. Uh, and I do think that's, that's true um, as well. They're obviously, like I said, still the most important piece, right? Like, they're the leaders in their classroom. But... Um, I think it opens up opportunities. You know, you talked earlier about the, you know, so how are you, what, how are you seeing it be successful or what are the, the markers? But I don't think that you can say that a textbook changed that classroom and made the students score better, right? I still don't think, I think it's the same with technology. Putting a Chromebook in front of a student or is not gonna make them smarter all of a sudden. You know, it's still gonna be the, the teacher in the classroom, um, changing the way the content's delivered and being there when the student needs something, just like we, you know, like we do now. If we need something, we look to a resource, right, to to help us. So, um, um, but there's still benchmarks that the students have to sit. There's still high stake high stake testing. We still have to teach the standards, right? So it's it's a piece of the environment, but it's not the end all, the be all. It's not the silver bullet that's going to just make our students smarter. It's just a part of it's a tool. Of, Exactly, mm -hmm. part of the environment. So as far as getting teachers uh, kind of acquainted then with this new direction, I guess, of teaching, with being more of the facilitator, is that something you guys offer professional development yes. um, early on and kind of yes. ongoing? Can you describe a little bit about um, your professional development programs? 
our educator group, um, were, well, they were the first ones to touch the whole Google platform and and uh, the Chromebook environment um, to get their hands on it, to get their input and their thoughts and their their drive on what should it look like. Um, so they're they're very important in in, in that process. Um, I think they. And they learn every day too. You know, they're it, it's it's a never-ending process. So I think they're evolving um, along with you know the Google product evolving, along with the teacher evolving, along with the student evolving. So they have to keep on that path too, or it won't be successful. I, you know, time is still probably the biggest issue for any teacher, right? Because responsibilities continue to um, be put on the plate and a lot of times things don't slide off the plate. And so it takes that PD time, which is already tiny and makes it even smaller. So I, I think where we have to be creative is to figure out how do we provide uh, good PD still, but in a different way, smaller chunks, shorter amount of time uh, when they can access the PD. Um, and then continue to share what other teachers are doing. Um, two, two years ago, um, our educator group um, started a, a conference for our teachers. So it's taught by GPS teachers for GPS teachers. Um, we hold that right after school gets out. And we have 500 teachers attend that. And the only reason it's not double that is because we don't have a facility to house that many teachers. So we have to cut it off. So it's a, basically a sellout uh, crowd every year. And, you know, they don't pay for that, but they also don't really get anything for that. They're coming to listen to see what their peers are doing and learn from them to be able to take something back to their classroom. So that's been a big uh, support in Gilbert as well, and that's going strong. It's been very exciting to be part of that now. We have a, a network of support for, for our teachers, everything from we have peer mentors that are teachers that have taken that extra training and gone up that extra level. Uh, we have Innovation, Academy, uh, Innovation Ambassadors that are at each site that help with uh, the teachers in innovating um, new learning into the classrooms. We have our 21st century specialists. So um, we have our technology specialists that also support in the classrooms. So uh, we have a lot of professional development opportunities, whether it's whole group instruction, maybe it's one-on-one, -on -one, maybe I just come to show you what, or help support you on what you want to do in your classroom. Um, and so I think for us, it's, it's definitely support letting the teachers know that we're here. There's a lot being implemented really fast. I mean, it's fast for us. It's, it's. I can't imagine in the classroom. It's, it's got to be overwhelming. So just to know that uh, you will have that support if you reach out for it. You're not going to be isolated into your classroom and expected to to perform um, on your own. Just we have lots of support, and uh, you know, all the branch reach out. And we want to make sure that they have training before any new piece of technology gets right. there because if they get a new piece of technology and they don't know how to use it and they have a bad experience with that, right. then, it's, then it's done. They'll never use it again. So it's important that they have that training before they even get it. So, Thank you. So with technology becoming more and more entrenched in education, where do you guys see data and analytics fitting into kind of accelerating learning for students? Uh, for us, uh, it's back to um, where it's not one thing. It's not one thing. So mm -hmm. students, you know, student success isn't a test score. It's everything. So I think analytics uh, help us to see where that student really is in their success, or to see the risk factors before they happen. So to try to find out if the student is at risk for not passing this test, or is at risk for anything to help us, or to help educators put that. Um, whatever programs they need to put in place to help that student succeed, trying to see maybe two years down the line where they're going to land based off of the data that's been collected over the last three years. So um, that's where I... Yeah, to get really to get into that predictive analytics of trying to really see, you know, catch that ahead of time so that uh, we know, you know, going into it, you know, what adjustments need to be made. The student knows where their weaknesses are. They know, you know, where their strengths are, where they need to focus more on. So. Yeah, I mean, data can be overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times it's you have all that data, but what do I do with that? Which again, mm -hmm. goes back to PD. I mean, we have such good technology that can collect massive amounts of data, um, but right, how do we use it to be proactive? Yeah. And you know, when we talk about personalized learning, you know, the 
the teacher's not just teaching to the whole class anymore, right? Like that's been gone for a while, or it, it should have been. You have 30 students sitting in front of you that are all at a different place. Mm -hmm. So using that data to help make that experience a little more personal for every student is, is critical and very difficult at the same time. What I'm personally excited about, one of the big things that's been happening recently is the advancement in artificial intelligence. Um, Google I.O. is going on right now, and Google's entire platform now is mission, you know, AI first, um, is kind of the route they're going. And one of the big limiters for artificial intelligence is enough data to train these artificial intelligences on. And we've kind of already built this platform, EdTech has built a platform of collecting really insightful data about these students. And so this next natural iteration that I'm starting to see is AI starting to actually extend admins and teachers in the future, especially as we talk about these 24-hour educational learning periods, not just stopping at the school boundary. So one of the questions I've been, I've been asking myself is what kind of features could an AI give that extend a teacher past the end of the school day? What kind of things could pop up on a screen or you know, encourage a student in a certain way that are a natural extension of the teacher learn from these wonderful amounts of data we've been collecting to manually sift through right now? Well, I think, you know, AI can be very important and useful in the future. Um, you know, it could single out that student that maybe the teacher's eye didn't catch that is having that learning problem. Maybe there's a, a way they solve the problem that's not right, but they got the right answer, so the teacher didn't catch it. You know, so maybe those kind of methods um, AI can catch and help train the teacher or uh, notify the teacher about that situation and maybe the, you know and then the teacher can help resolve it. Um, so it, it's again another tool on top of everything else that could be useful um, in a singleized approach to a student. Yeah that's a good point. I mean it can easily probably detect patterns of whatever you know pick a math problem and it's making students making the same mistake every time but you know that it takes time to catch those things right so if it helps save time because technology still can be beneficial because it saves us time right. and things you know then it gives more time for that instruction can you have to be quick because in the big scheme thing we don't we don't have the students that long i mean that's what it seems All like right. it seems like it goes by like that yeah. even during an implementation period you know there's there's going to be students that miss it even though they're currently here, because it's it's we have them just for such a short amount of time, so we'd have to evolve. Yeah, absolutely. Quite quickly, it makes it makes a lot of sense to what you were saying. Um, just in, in kind of in regards to uh, it it being a tool, right? It's not it's not a replacement. Yeah. Right. right. Off AI in movies was always a replacement. Right. right? But that's not what AI yeah. is now. No. Right. It's an augmentation. It's an extension of the human. Mm -hmm. And so right. it does need to become a tool that saves time, as mm -hmm. you were saying. Um, and also is quick enough that it actually helps the student. And so as long as you can get those pieces right, I, I think it's got some really exciting possibilities. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. So, you know, it's often said that a culture of innovation and the notion of not being afraid to fail go hand in hand. I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts on that statement and maybe touch a little bit on how that's played out in your districts. Well, I fail all the time, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things, you know, if, if you don't try it and learn from it, you're never going to do anything. So, you know, there's multiple instances where I've done something, tried something, and it just didn't work out, you know, and I, and I think the whole process is you have to learn from it. Um, and if you're not doing that, you're not evolving at all. I mean, and, you know, part of my responsibility is creating an environment where everyone feels safe to fail, right? A lot of times that's that you don't see that. And so, you know, should I try this? Well, I could, but I'll take the safe route because I know it works because of fear of what will happen if I, if I fail. So that's part of, you know, my responsibility as the leader of the department is to create that environment that uh, promotes that. And they, we seem to be talking a lot about it in education about uh, relieving that fear of failure. Being, it's okay to fail and growth mindset and, and all of that. Uh, but it's really, failure is really a hard word in education because you're not supposed to fail. Uh, as a district, DICERT's uh, kind of adopted iteration. We will iterate it, and iterate and <laughs> iterate. But, uh, <laughs> but 
but not so much we want to fail, but we are, um, our words are iteration. <laughs> Learn from our mistakes. Learn from our know. mistakes mm -hmm. and yeah. try again and not be afraid. Yeah, really the, you know, one of the best ways to innovate you know, is to learn what you did wrong, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, find a new path, you know, that's how innovation happens. Mm -hmm. So it's important the students and the staff, you know, both have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And GoGuardian has its own department devoted to just innovation. Mm -hmm. And the interesting kind of way that we've positioned it is uh, basically never accepting status quo as the final answer, which it sounds like all of you guys are doing in different ways in your districts, right. but it is that that not having a fear, or at least iterating, mm -hmm. whenever there is the kind of that, that first fallback. But also that, that ideology that maybe just because it's been this way for 30 or 40 years doesn't mean it should be this way for another 100. Right. Well, I mean, when we were at the Google Summit not too long ago, one of the speakers said, you know, you have to let go of your past successes, right? Mm -hmm. And that just rings so true. Yeah. Because, you know, we've all done what we consider great things, right? Um, and they work well. But what if, you know? And so sometimes you do have to kind of, all right, that was good, but how can we make that even a little bit better? Wow. So in terms of social media and <laughs> in education, I'm curious, are there ways you've seen a school district turn social media into a positive learning environment? It's actually a question that we had. Someone chatted in before we uh, even started this webinar. So I wanted to bring that question up. I found it pretty interesting. Uh, Digital citizenship is, is key, I think, with social media. For, from an IT standpoint, it's kind of hard because we don't have control over that, and we like to have control, <laughs> uh, especially when we're being held responsible for the security you know, of our, our network. Um, I think uh, there are tools to help us monitor. We, have, we do monitor social media to a certain extent, um, but um, our biggest, I think, it, with our biggest thing would be to uh, teach digital citizenship to both students and staff and parents so that they understand about their footprint and, and what they put out there uh, is going to stay out there. And um, I mean, it's just educating. There's nothing wrong with social media. It's just a matter of, you know, doing it the right way. How it's used. Yeah. yeah. And we did, you know, touching on that, we implemented a digital um, learning environment, focusing on those kind of things. Um, it, it, it's really benefited the students, I think. Um, they have to take the course before they even get the Chromebook in seventh grade. And, and they, it, it's not like a one-time thing. It, it's an evolving thing that they keep learning um, throughout the year. And we do belts, belt colors, um, so that you can work your way all, up, all the way up to a black belt. And uh, I think they find, uh, the students even find it engaging and fun to do. Um, you know, it's always yet to be seen how much they get out of it, but um, I think it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, it's, it, digital citizenship is, it's going to have to be as common as math and science, you know. Um, and I think it's tough right now because, you know, we did adopt curriculum to help uh, out to make that a little bit easier for the classroom teachers. Um, but I think it can be seen as an extra thing to do. However, that's where we're at as well. And so, but I think it's just understanding that you can work that in and it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a big time consuming extra thing. You know, in every subject area, you can work in digital citizenship, whether it's the picture you're downloading from somewhere and copyright issues. And that all kind of can work into the curriculum as it existed before. But you got to be creative. And teachers need to know, how, to, how do I do that? And they need help with that also and support there. Um, we had a kind of a grassroots uh, uh, program pop up uh, at one of our junior highs, too. The students wanted to do something. And they started an entire campaign around posting the positive. Um, and these two little girls are amazing right and we've been able to take them I think we took them yeah yeah we took them to this Google summit um, and it was really good and I mean I'd like to replicate that across the entire Gilbert school district I think it would be amazing so I'm trying to figure out how to do that um, but you know those kind of things will pop up and the students I think will probably at the end of the day um, They'll probably want more rules than not, right. even than the adults, and you kind of have to back them down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely has to become 
not a special extra thing. It has to become part of the environment. Well, they're growing up in this, you know, social media world. Right. Mm -hmm. This is all they know. Right. So, I mean, it's, you know, that's one of the things that we have to make sure that they know how to do it responsibly. So. Right. I've seen teachers do things like Twitter chats and whatnot, so they'll do activities uh, across Twitter that way. Um, I mean, we do have quite a bit of social media blocked in our district, you know, and that's another conversation. But um, Twitter's open. Teachers have done some stuff with that as well and incorporated uh, some other things. But Yeah. And I know, I know we're, we're taking it seriously at GoGuardian to the point where we've actually started messing around with ways that we can actually help with the Digital Citizenship Project. Mm -hmm. uh, Smart Alerts, which I know Scott has had the chance to deal with, and um, is one of the features that we added from a suggestion of an IT admin, actually, um, was instead of blocking a web page when you detect it's bad, you know, because we're using artificial intelligence to be able to say this website, no matter if it's social media or whatever, has this kind of content, um, instead of blocking it, send a message to the student instead, and you can configure that. And so we had one of our pilot districts, uh, they had 20,000 devices try it out. Um, and they were getting 500 reports of explicit activity a week. And they switched from a block to a message, and they went to 100 a week over the course of a week. And it was amazing to see these students, when they just had the interaction change from wall to, hey, be a better digital citizen, to completely changing their behavior, five times decrease and yeah. behavior change. And it was, it's really cool to see a tool that originally was not built for that purpose mm -hmm. kind of turn into this beginning of a digital citizenship tool. Mm -hmm. anyway. right. So with kind of technology transforming education so fast and everything seems to be happening at such a high pace, how important is it for you guys to get out there, go to these learning summits, go to see other districts, and kind of keep up to date with seeing what other other folks are doing. It's critical. Yeah, it's key. I it's think critical. It's critical. Very exactly. important. Yeah. It's not an option. Yeah. I, I think in the past, you know, school districts have been isolated in, in their own little world, and what they do is what they do. It doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. I think over the maybe the last five, ten years, you're starting to see in a shift of more collaboration between, among districts. Um, hey, what are you guys doing, you know, sort of thing. Um, and I know personally on my side it's helped out a lot. I, as the districts around us are all doing different things, but at least we're communicating and, and, and learning from them. And we're all being faced with the same challenges. We're all, we all might be doing it differently, but the challenges are the same. And so it's nice to not have to reinvent the wheel when you know you can reach out and go look. And you might go look at five different places and take something small from each place right. and make your own. I mean, it's, it's definitely critical. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You mentioned earlier the you know, four walls of the classroom. I say that all the time. We have to break down the four walls of our cubicles and our offices mm -hmm. and, and get out. I'm very, very big on that because I learned from Dysarts and Peorias and even the tiny little school districts in Arizona. I think we're lucky in the state because we have a good uh, listserv for the CIOs and the technicians and it's used all the time and people do pass questions mm -hmm. off and then you know we can easily even though that's kind of an archaic way a listserv right but it's the quickest seemed to be the quickest way to communicate with, uh, with uh, all the districts around our state and it's been very beneficial so mm -hmm. yeah, you can't be an island yeah. islands mm -hmm. don't do well after a while <laughs> yeah get left behind yeah. that was going to be one of my right. favorite questions is, is let's say you're you know you're at a district and you're just starting your technology program um, at least with like one-to-one -one in Chromebooks how do you start talking to other schools do you reach directly out to them like what did you guys do when you went and visited all these schools in different states you reached out mm -hmm. hey, I, hear you guys are, I hear you guys are doing this what are you doing about that I mean and and not only just what's going on in the classroom even you know how do you like that filter how's that working for you how about you know that you know router these switches I mean it's it's all out there. People have used it. You might as well get their, their feedback. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we're, we're lucky here. We have a pretty good community, I think, of IT um, oh, yeah. folks in K-12, even outside of K-12 in the state, you know, including the colleges um, that we've talked to a lot as well. Um, and we have, there's a great conference yearly that that's CIO-CTO conference, and so we see a lot of the same faces. Mm -hmm. It's a small circle. So in that sense, I feel lucky in this state that we have that good communication amongst a lot of the school districts. Definitely. All right, well, that about wraps it up for all the questions that I have for you guys here today. So, without further ado, I'd like to open up the floor for questions that you guys, the viewers, have chatted in. Uh, remember, you can go to hashtag state of ed tech and chat in your questions or just place them in the chat box. And we're going to start going through some of your guys' questions now. 
All right, the first question here is from Brett Baker. Uh, how large are your districts? Uh, Gilbert Public Schools, um, we have 27 elementary, six junior highs, um, five traditional high schools, and a couple alternative high schools. Um, in total, we have about 36,000 students. Guys, sir, we have about 25,000 students, uh, 19 elementaries, four high schools, uh, alternative high school, online school. All right, this one's from Mike Duarte. Aside from access to technology, what do you see as the biggest ed tech challenge facing educators today? Um, for us, it's uh, bridging the homework gap, uh, basically getting internet to uh, students out there that don't have internet at home, you know, trying to do the personalized learning in the one-to-one. -one. It's really hard if you do not have internet access at home if you're taking a device. So we're looking at options so that we could provide that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, we don't want our students having to run around and find a hot spot somewhere. Um, you know, they need to be able to to work at home with, on the content. So, um, really the same. Okay. All right. So this one's from Scott Comstock. Do you think the traditional interactive whiteboard will be around for a while, or are we going to see migrations to more interactive online spaces? It's already migrated. All it's right. the interactive it flat has. panels. Uh, we, we are hopeful to uh, quit purchasing projectors and look more towards the interactive flat panels. Uh, they have the software, the same type of software as the interactive whiteboards, but yeah. they don't need Everything built into one. Everything built into one. You don't need the lamps and worry about the bulb replacement and putting the cabling in the ceiling. And yeah, again, I, I agree. I mean, the price points still need to drop a yes. little bit, <laughs> um, but they're coming down. But mm -hmm. at the same time, the mobility that our uh, teachers have now, being able to be connected to, you know, whatever, if the traditional projector um, wirelessly now, then it allows them to move around the room, and it's really easy to hand a, a device to a student and, you know, use a digitized pen and be able to, to work right there on that. So the need for having to go up to the front of the classroom uh, is becoming less and less. Okay, it looks like we have a couple Go Guardian specific questions here, so Tyler, maybe you can uh, chime in on these. Mm -hmm. From Jeff Hines, what are the good ways what are good ways to use Go Guardian to improve behavior? That is a great question. Actually, I'd love to turn it over to you guys first um, about your experiences with Go Guardian, and then I'm happy to tack on my own. Well, in our in our innovation academy, you know, uh, most of the students, you know, it's not a standard classroom structure, so you don't have rows of students, and you know, you have might have students on a couch over there or in that corner, all working on different things, which makes it more difficult for teachers to to manage the students or keep track of what the students are doing. Um, and so, a Go Guardian teacher allows us to really the teacher to see what the students are doing from one location, and and you know, the students know that you know the teacher can see what they're doing. It helps the students stay on track and. And, and kind of you know move in the right direction and, and stay on target with their work. You know, I think uh, you know just the filtering alone. Um, you know, shaping them to go in the right directions um, and not go to the sites to get distracted uh, or inappropriate material. Um, I think that's all a part of it too. Yeah, for me, I, I brought it up earlier, but the smart alerts, the thing that we, we found um, is instead of blocking web pages, sending students messages, as I mentioned, decreased five times um, how often they were trying to access explicit material. Yeah, and you know, we've been trying out smart alerts for about a month now, and uh, I agree. Um, I, I, I do think the fact that they see that message will uh, deter them from maybe keeping going in that direction. It's just, it's really interesting the difference between a block page and a messaging page, which I personally would have never come to without the help of admins suggesting it. Well, I think they've gotten so accustomed to seeing that block page. <laughs> they could just keep trying yeah, and trying and trying. Yeah, and, and they just, I don't think they realize that it's being logged and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. when they receive that message, they know mm -hmm. something on the other end is happening. So mm -hmm. I think it's helpful. More awareness. Mm -hmm. More awareness. A little reminder never. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's almost like you, we also, it's not like you block the web page. It's still there for them. But right. it's kind of like that shaping that we're talking about Correct. where you say, look, it's your choice. We're not going to. 
block it, but you know it's not the right decision in right. letting them make that choice. Correct. Well, some things we are going to block. <laughs> <laughs> sure. sure. Yeah. For certain age levels, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, you for have sure. to do it. Absolutely. All right. From Bobby Calderon, how can, you, how can some teachers utilize Google in their classroom besides sharing docs? Eileen, maybe you want to touch on this one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think this I one, think is, this one is all for me. Answer without actually knowing um, what I guess the goals of the teachers are. Um, there's many ways that I've seen it used very creatively. So some of my favorite examples is getting on Hangouts, and this is done in the third or fourth grade classroom, for example, where you partner with someone at a, out of state or out of the country. Those are even more fun, and to give context clues in terms of learning geography. So I am by the Pacific Ocean, and um, and then to narrow down to where you actually are. So that's one way that I've seen that's super creative. I heard a story where um, they students held a different flag in the background, so they to totally misled another group of students. But I think fundamentally, if you look at Docs, um, Gmail, Drive, Sheets, um, the whole host of tools, it is really meant so that teachers and students can work in ways um, in a more collaborative manner. And a classroom on top of that really is able to help streamline that process. So if you look at forms, for example, you can use that for formative assessments and um, have all of that be integrated into classroom. Um, but so those are just some spatterings of examples of different ways that it can be used. I would, I think, start off though with the question of what are teachers doing now and how can I use technology to enhance what I'm doing either by uh, helping students learn better, perhaps those students who are afraid to speak up and you can use software to give them a voice. Um, or to help teachers improve the way that they work, um, giving them more time back. So that's what I hear, I guess, from my end of it, from working with school districts. But I have some folks here that I'm sure have some concrete examples as well. Get to that space where you're creating, not just consuming, right? And so I think there's so many tools available um, and new tools coming constantly, which is which is a great thing and so um but yeah the 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 mystery hangouts are that's one of the most enjoyable things mm -hmm. to go into a classroom and watch students connecting with other students from around the world uh, and so many standards can be worked right into that lesson but yet it's engaging and fun and relevant to them all right looks like we have another go guardian question here from brian veal uh, what new features can we expect to see in the near future from GoGuardian admin and GoGuardian teacher modules? That's a great question, Brian. Um, I'd love to do kind of a high level, like why we even rebuilt the admin product. Because uh, initially, three years ago, it started with our founder calling admins directly and saying, what do you need? And that was right when the, the kind of the Chromebook market was just kind of taking off in education. And so that's what we did. We built the features that admins told us to build. Um, obviously, over three years, it's changed quite a bit. Um, and we've continued to speak with uh, admins and educators about what they need. But when you build a kind of a, your initial product, sometimes those new features that people need don't quite fit into it. And so the, the new iteration really is just uh, completely coming at the problem again um, to fit in all those features we've already been building in a really nice, beautiful experience. Um, the main things that we can talk about with the admin product, uh, filtering, we're adding on the ability to uh, do it based on a schedule, time of day, because now that devices are going home, uh, you need to have different kind of filtering policies, or at least you may want to. Um, theft recovery has become uh, a huge deal uh, for just protecting devices, uh, and Google has done some amazing work on their APIs to allow uh, serial numbers and asset tags to come over into theft recovery. Um, we even have uh, per-student filtering. And I'm, I'm going down the list here of, of all the things we have, because I believe it's over 100 things that we added in the next iteration, so it's a lot. Um, you need a list to keep track. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Smart Alerts, which we talked about, which is kind of that reimagining the way that you, you understand student behavior and how you get students help, in some cases, like self-harm. Um, looking past traditional keyword flagging, which just doesn't work in a lot of cases, and going to kind of an AI-based, context-aware um, flagging ability, which is able to bring information directly to people who need it without overloading them with unnecessary notifications. 
Um, and with our teacher product, uh, we're really just focusing on stability. Teachers have so much that they need to focus on in the classroom. The last thing they need to worry about is a product that's not quick or not fast, you know, that's not um, kind of uh, doing exactly what they needed to do. So our main focus there is just making a seamless experience from the beginning to end for the teachers. Right. How do we get reluctant teachers to make a paradigm shift to more of a design-based classroom? This one's from Brett Baker again. Goodness, yeah. I, mean, <laughs> well, I think we touched uh, on many things mm -hmm. uh, earlier. It, it's just, it is the big picture. Uh, support, PD, stakeholder buy-in from all levels, leadership at the sites. Um, but I think still, it's just getting out and seeing things happening in other classrooms. You know, when you can see that, it gives you something tangible and real to, to grab onto, and then it gives you ideas. And you bring those back and implement those and, and try. It's definitely like leading by example or finding those, uh, the ones that are doing it in the classroom already and showcasing that and letting them know it can be done. These, these are the success stories and this is how you do it and definitely the support piece and PD for sure. All right. So this one's from Ian Turner. Cheating seems ubiquitous no matter what technological platforms are being used to combat it, whether it's GoGuardian or anything else. What non-tech strategies have you seen that work best in a one-to-one -one context? Um, besides rigorous teaching of academic honesty and digital citizenship. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> <It's Be> so. <laughs> <laughs> you just took all the tools away. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's pretty hard. Uh, I don't know if there's ever going to be a foolproof way to prevent cheating. You know, yeah, it's, it's almost impossible. There's, uh, it's new way, they're coming up with new ways, I mean, Kids are resilient and <laughs> kids creative. Are, kids, and, are, uh, kids are smart. So maybe sure. Ian hit the nail on the head there with um, you know rigorous um, digital digital yeah, citizenship. citizenship. It, it's, I mean, yeah. we can't if we remove digital citizenship. That's the hardest part. I mean, that's the education. That's the you know letting them know what they can and cannot do or should and should not be doing. And then if you take away our tools, <laughs> how are we <laughs> going to know? I mean, it's uh, that's a tough one. Yeah. I would sound walking uphill both ways in the snow, <laughs> but I mean, kids have always been creative. We were all creative as well growing up, and I, mediums change, but there's always going to be creative ways around something, um, you know. But again, it's building that foundation of digital citizenship, and even uh, with the know, tools and the, yeah. they're still finding ways. I mean, it just it happens. We're just, I mean, it's our job to make sure. It doesn't happen as much, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, they're there, they'll find a way. All right, this one's from Mike Duarte. When you give students advice as a major part of learning during the year, what message do you think it sends if you take it back during the summer? Well, we hit, I mean, hit earlier a little bit on what we do in, in Gilbert as far as uh, that they keep the devices for summer school and whatnot. But then we also talked about, you know, many of the students have devices at home, right? So we're looking in a way to um, provide equitable access to those students that don't have devices over the summertime. So, you know, that's kind of the approach that, that we're taking on that. So, you know, a lot of households have four or five computers. So the students still do have a device, and they still do communicate uh, at times with the, you know, with the teachers over the summertime. And we're just finishing up our first pilot of the one-to-one -one this year. Uh, we will be piloting a summer school one-to-one, -one, uh, which they will be able to take at home during the summer. So I think we'll know more uh, once we've uh, finished summer school and where we're going to go at with next year and next summer. So we're still in that infancy stages. Just want to make sure we do it right. Yeah, we want to. Yeah definitely make sure. All right, from Kyle Calderwood, what can smaller districts do to keep up with growing tech trends in the classroom, um, specifically things like funding? I mean, that's a great question. I think even for larger school districts, funding, you know, can, can be an issue. Um, uh, you know, there's obviously grant opportunities. Uh, PTO, PTSOs uh, play a big part, uh, even in our large school district, with helping provide more devices mm -hmm. uh, at our schools. You know, especially at our elementary schools. Um, and then a lot of teachers still do like the donor choose type of sites um, as well. So we get a lot of, of teachers that will come to us because uh, they're interested in doing that. And so we try to help them. We want to be involved in all those pieces so we can help them get the best pricing or help provide any kind of support they would need when bringing
technology into their classroom. Definitely. I think um, funding, yeah, we're all hit with the same, same problem. Um, we've had to get creative. So that's what it comes down to is being creative, finding, exhausting all resources of, of ways to get funding. Um, and it is, uh, you know, communicating with the, the PTOs and PTAs and the campuses because you don't want them, once they do get the funding, to purchase things that will not work on our network. Or uh, maybe they're paying consumer prices when we can get a better price through our vendors. So it's definitely communicating with them, letting them know that these are, these are our quotes and they can definitely donate the funding and we can purchase it through our means and get them the best price and make sure that the equipment uh, can work. Stretch the dollar. Yeah. yeah. Well, and to add to that just a little bit too, I mean, you know, you need your support from your school board, mm -hmm. right? So uh, if things are priority, then they're a priority and, and, you know, they will find creative ways mm -hmm. to fund what's necessarily for the, cl for the classroom, for the students. Okay, this one's from James Haas. How do you see micro-credentials micro working into the K-12 space? We already started, um, I know that we've already started doing that with our uh, educators. So their um, Ed Services is already working um, with, is it uh, Ed Leader? I can't think of the name of the, I think it's Ed Leader and uh, getting the micro-credentials. And we have teachers that have already earned some. Hmm. So it's become now a process in Dysart. So. All right, a couple questions here from Brett Baker. Do you let students rent to own the Chromebooks? Rent to own? Is it? Yeah. Is that what, yeah, that's what it says here. I mean, like, mm -hmm. probably purchase them at the end yeah, of the year. Yeah, I think that's what that oh. means. So purchase at the end of the year. Uh, I know we've talked about it. Yeah, we've discussed it. We don't have a particular program in place uh, for that. There are some other school districts in Arizona, I believe, that are doing that. But um, yeah, we haven't. It's too new for us. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so there's only a couple questions here left. Uh, remember, as viewers, you guys can uh, tweet us questions at hashtag, hashtag State of Ed Tech or continue placing them in the chat box. Uh, we'll keep going through the final questions here. Um, do you block messaging apps like Google Hangouts? Personally, um, it's gotten difficult to even block Hangouts. Um, as a district, you know, we were kind of in the direction of blocking it initially. Um, there's one school that it is allowed, um, but I still find that they find ways around um, to open up a Hangout chat. Um, so I found it difficult to kind of get that locked down. Um, I think Hangouts is a great tool, you know, um, can be a great tool, but it's, it goes back to that uh, digital citizenship piece, um, making sure that they're doing the right thing with it. So. Want to talk about blocking hangouts? Um, well, we, we have it open, um, and it's more of we try and rely on the digital citizenship and classroom management um, because th our students do use it to you know do collaboration and with projects and everything like that and with the teacher. Um, so it's really trying to find that balance, um, you know, and, and it, you know, if you close one, they're going to find another, um, right. you know, outside of that anyway. So it's, it's really trying to find the best way, you know, that you can, you know, manage and, and monitor um, inside the classroom. So. All right. It looks like this is our last question here uh, from Latresa Carlisle. Did anyone offer their parents a basic workshop on the basic knowledge of the Chromebook and how to check their homework in Google Classroom? That's a good question. Um, I know that we've had particular sites offer nights like that, so it's handled at the at the school site. Um, gosh, we'd have to go back before my time, but yeah. when the rollout was started. We had some parent meetings um, before the Chromebooks were rolled out um, that they could come to, and, and it wasn't so much training at that point, um, although that's a great idea. Um, but it was, it was more to get familiar with what a Chromebook was and, and, and how to use just the general use of it, not really pertaining to homework or classroom or anything like that. Um, but yeah, we, we did have um, some open meetings about that. So uh, with our first endeavor uh, being the Innovation Academy, we did have parent nights and uh, did do training um, 
with the Chromebooks, letting them know that they will be able to take one home uh, and how it works and what to do in case if it, it does get uh, damaged or stolen and kind of walk through. And we even had uh, the students there, they had to sign in. We showed them how to change their passwords. We put them in their cases and put their names on them and uh, they were able to take them home that night. So um, that was like a couple days right before school started last year. So kind of moving forward along those lines, we're looking at those processes on how we're going to implement that at a district-wide level or at least uh, for those uh, special projects that at the other schools that will be taking devices home. Um, it seemed to work well uh, and so I, we're, when we meet, our committee meets, we discuss how we're going to do that then for like uh, fifth through eighth grade or, or sixth through seventh if they do get to take them home. So looking at those processes currently. <laughs> Then, then towards, towards the middle. The middle. So, so one example is a smaller school district, about 6,000 students. They did their rollout. Um, and when they did that from the beginning, they invited parents, sort of like Dice Outer is like a back to school um, night or beginning when everybody picks up their schedules actually. And so they um, gave each of their students their Chromebooks and then had sort of an orientation for parents. And a, a separate school district, um, 10,000 students, one to one. And it, it was something that they had not done. And it was something that was asked from parents and they wanted to have that connection with the school to understand a little bit better of what is happening with technology. And so that's when they went back and decided, you know, this is something that we should do. And then they started um, that planning process so that it can become an evening where they invited parents to learn a little bit more about the school district, about what it is that they're doing with technology and how they're using technology in the classroom to support instruction. So it can go sort of both ways. Um, but I think the most important thing, or at least what I took away from that is meeting um, the needs of parents and so that parents really understand what is happening so that you can have their support as well. A lot of it is that communication piece that is key. Great. All right, so that wraps it up for all the questions. Were there any topics that you guys as the panelists wanted to touch on that we didn't cover? Give you a... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we covered a lot. I think we're good. we covered a lot. Yeah, we did cover a lot. All right, well, I want to thank the panelists here today for participating and all of the viewers for tuning in to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Chris Kay, and we are signing off. Thank you for watching. <laughs>